So I'm finally going to try to start explaining T3 or Taylor's theory of time. Um, to start out, I'm going to reference Ted Sider's paper entitled Temporal Parts, uh, which tries to provide a method for tracing objects through time. So um, in this section, in this intro of the, the theory, I'm, I'm just going to try to deal with how we can uh, track objects through time or how we can try to describe reality as it exists in four dimensions. Um, so first off, to define an object, I believe my theory is close to nihilism, which states that the only objects which can truly be said to exist are those which cannot be broken down into similar parts. It's close to that. Um, I'll explain the difference later. But uh, in Sider's paper, he uh, he goes on to describe temporal parts, and his theory says that time can be indexed. Uh, and then an object can be defined by its position and movement between arbitrarily assigned points in time. And that much I can pretty much agree with. I think that it's really close to the truth. Um, he also claims, that, well, the truth. <laughs> Uh, I think it's really close to my theory. He also claims that temporal parts could describe an object's state at a single point in time, and that I can't agree with because uh, a point in time is, by definition, has no length, and nothing can exist within a zero. Nothing can exist within something that doesn't have any length. And so, well, you could define, you, you could describe uh, a theoretical object at a point in time, you would not be able to s describe any existing object at a point in time because it could not exist within the point in time. Um, the temporal parts theory has other problems which I'll go over later and because of those I built upon the idea of temporal parts uh, using the idea of temporal objects. I define a temporal object as the sum of the movements described by the temporal parts of an object, which has, and that object has no smaller parts that move differently than itself. Um, so if uh, we pretend for a second that my hand is the is, well, my hand and the fingers are the smallest things in existence, then if my fingers are moving like this, then each finger could be described by a separate temporal object, but if my hand is moving together, then it could be described by a single temporal object. Um, and we can to to use a bit of a, a metaphor, we can think of temporal objects like the movement <coughs> of water within a river. And there are obvious lines that we can draw um, as to how we can distinguish the water from certain waters from other waters, i.e. the river can branch off and become two distinct bodies of water. Um, but how can we measure the di difference between the water itself? Presuming that all water is essentially the same, the only distinction between the water and each river would be the movement that got it to its river. Um, if the river is time and the water is objects traveling along it, then temporal parts can explain that distinction. But temporal parts theory doesn't hold up as an accurate description of reality. Um, so throw away the idea that all water is the same and uh, picture a location along a river with a steady current and a steady underbed. Um, the water f flows through the location, so the water that goes past one hour can be said to be different water than that which goes by an hour later, yet the movement of the water remains the same. Um, we could draw a bucket of water from the river and compare it to a bucket drawn an hour earlier and we will likely find very similar water. We could also compare it to water drawn from another part of the river, another river altogether, and find relatively different water, but we can't make these comparisons without first taking the water out of the river, which automatically makes it different water from the water which does continue to flow through the river. Um, so in 
similarly, we, we can't give objects intrin intrinsic properties of measurement without first placing them outside of the stream of time and into a theoretical universe. While the calculations that we c come up with can be said to be representative of objects in the physical universe, they can never be calculations of those objects themselves, as the objects are continually moving through time, and while those objects which are either past or future representations of a specific object may exist in their own versions of the present, they cannot be said to be the same object. This is why I propose that we don't use temporal parts, because the temporal parts relies on, um, it, it tries to define the object itself. Um, so we can't really use it for the purposes of anything other than uh, casual descriptions we can more accurately describe the universe using temporal objects which is the movement of a group of temporal parts of an object which all follow the same path so instead of talking about the water in a certain section of r the river we can talk about the way that the water flows and then we can make calculations on the movement without actually having to um, what without having to describe each water molecule. <coughs> um, so, yeah, that's uh, that, that's a quick intro on T three. I at, at first it it's uh, it, it can appear like it's uh, a deterministic theory of time in that since the uh, the stream of time is a steady movement then how can there be any change in either the future or the past and since uh, I do believe that we are uh, that objects are uh, endure or perjure I'm still not sure which is the right word for that but um, objects exist at every point in time basically um, where T3 um, differs from a deterministic point of view is in the introduction of random elements to the timeline which I believe is um, it's a, a logical necessity it there, there must have been at least one random event and so there's nothing to say that there can't be more but that's another section of the theory which I'll go over uh, on another date.